it. The sacrilege of time. In its primary meaning, there is a sacrilege of time when the Sabbath or the Lord's Day is abused or profaned. The law in both Exodus and Deuteronomy gives particular attention to the interpretation of this law. In the original Declaration of the Ten Commandments, it is stated thus, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Rylardsdam has said of God's rest on the seventh day, This rest constituted the creation of the Sabbath, which thus expresses God's own nature. The Sabbath expresses God's nature because God, being beyond time and necessity, which are aspects of his creation, knows the end from the beginning. His creative work is thus not problematic, but totally determined and a fiat expression. God declared the word, Let there be, and all things were created. God's rest is thus grounded in the perfection of his work. Not a hair nor an atom can go astray or a field in his predestined work of creation, redemption and recreation. God's rest is thus an expression of his sovereignty and of the absoluteness of his government. Man cannot govern absolutely any aspect of his life or world, but he can rest in the fact that his God and Saviour does govern absolutely and rests in his government. Only with such a faith and with such a God can man rest. Man may worship without such a faith, but he cannot rest. In the restatement of the commandments in Moses' farewell restatement of the law to Israel, another aspect of the Sabbath is brought out. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labour and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. The Sabbath, while commemorating creation in its seventh day pattern, began with the Passover in the Old Testament and with the Day of Resurrection in the New Testament in order to celebrate salvation. Creation is the pattern, salvation the source of our rest. Sacrilege of time thus involves, first, a denial of the fact of creation or a contempt thereof. In an evolving universe, man, as the potential god of this quote-unquote creation out of a primeval chaos, cannot rest. Everything depends on him, and he is not omnipotent nor infallible. The Sabbath thus ceases to be rest for him and becomes instead an opportunity for some other form of activity than work. It means a change of pace, 
not a total rest. Second, where man denies salvation by Christ, he denies rest and commits the sacrilege of time by making his time, work, and activity redemptive. Man creates his own timetable with the world socialist, humanist utopia at the end, as his man-made Sabbath. The Sabbath of man will express the finished nature of man, the new god of creation. Until then, there can be no rest, only work to create the worker's paradise. Before considering a third form of the sacrilege of time, it is necessary to examine briefly some aspects of time. Clearly, time is one resource that man, having wasted, can never recover. Time cannot be regained, nor can it be hoarded for future use. There is no way of stockpiling time for future use. In some cultures, time is made all-important, and eternity is despised or denied. Such a culture becomes sensate, totally present-oriented and eager to exploit the moment and its pleasures to the full, in that nothing else is held to be real. Existentialism is the philosophy of such a faith. On the other hand, some cultures depreciate time for eternity. Only that which is timeless and of enduring value is worthwhile. The academic world, because of its roots in ancient Greece, is deeply imbued with this contempt for time. Its goal is often a post-historical culture, a civilization beyond change and embodying the universals established by autonomous and radically humanistic man. To this end, all effort is exerted to create the universal world order which will fix civilization and time. Both the sensate culture and the anti-historical faith lead to a contempt for man. In the one, only the moment matters. In the other, only the new universals have any validity. Man as a person whose life is thus filled with often trifling concerns is despised by the man who believes it to be a waste of time to be courteous to anyone especially non-intellectuals. Buying and selling, and especially salesmanship, are regarded as the epitome of barbarism because of their deep involvements with time and people. In the dream world of the anti-historical scholars, the sordid world of salesmen and time-involved people will be eliminated. The new eternity of autonomous man will prevail Some years ago, a professor who was mildly chided by his wife at a university gathering for his boorishness snarled back, I have no time for etiquette and small chit-chat. He had no time for man as such, only for important people, and his snobbishness, his false philosophy, and his rudeness were justified in his eyes by his self-importance. The Bible, however, requires us, from the modern viewpoint, to waste a great amount of time, one day in seven, one sabbatical year in seven, and the 49th and 50th years as a double Sabbath because of the Jubilee. Added together, this means more than one day in seven, because, in addition to this, the sabbatical years greatly increase the time of rest. But this is not all. A requirement of that rest is a fellowship with the religious and educational leader, the Levites, the foreigner, the widow, and the orphan. We are thus required to avoid an aristocratic, snobbish, or class association. The law of the third tithe, rejoicing before the Lord, plainly declares, at the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shall lay it up within thy gates. And the Levites, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, 
which are within thy gates shall come, and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 27 and 28. This requirement of fellowship and community is a type of that which is expected at all other times. To associate with such poor or unfortunate believers only in the third year, at the time of a festival, was to disobey the spirit of the law. This law is especially relevant to our time. It is the mark of the age that exclusiveness is sought. The rich want hobbies which will separate them from others. They want to do what nobody else is doing, travel where no one else has yet gone, and to live in separation from others. Those poorer seek to imitate these habits of the wealthy to be with it in being different. The world of scholarship similarly prides itself on being quote-unquote different, despises the common man who has neither the time, interest or ability to master their field of knowledge and regards it as an imposition to be forced to deal with or to be courteous to quote-unquote ordinary people. Apart from a sinful pride, there is here also a violation of God's laws of community. The third sacrilege of time is thus not only a denial of the Sabbath rest, but of the community and fellowship with God and man which the Sabbath rest requires. Because God's creation is a seamless garment, we can never overlook or deny the interlocking nature of all things therein, law and grace, rest and community, man and man, work and Sabbath and all things else are inextricably interrelated. We cannot define anything therefore purely in terms of itself, but always in the context of God's purpose and his creation. Thus the word government is today reduced to one aspect of government, the state Government means, first of all, the self-government of man, then the family, the church, the school, community, vocation and society, and also the state. Without the other forms of government, beginning with self-government, the totalitarian state results, and the collapse of the state begins. All forms of government must rest on the prior fact of self-government. The same is true of worship. The idea of worship is today reduced to a church service. If worship is not primarily outside the church, it will soon disappear in the church. Worship must first of all exist in man's inner life, in his family and calling, to be alive in the church. This applies also to the Sabbath. If the Sabbath as community between God and man, and between man and man in Christ, is not basic, then it becomes an empty form. The Sabbath is the joyful rest of men who labour faithfully six days and seven, and can rest on the seventh, knowing that God is Lord over time and all things, and a day in rest together in the Lord is more productive than a millennium of work and rest apart from him. Lauchley has commented. Because man is saved by God and not by creation, he shares in the reality of eternity and not of time. We must rather say, because man is saved by God and not by himself or the creation around him, he shares in the reality of eternity as well as time, and he knows the priority of God and his eternal decree. He can, therefore, value time without overvaluing it. He can live in time without being its creature. The Lord makes this very clear as he speaks through Isaiah, declaring, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. 
The existentialist must make haste. He has only time, and not even a time with meaning. He must make haste to establish a meaning and then to develop it, yet always knowing that meaninglessness is ultimate. This reduced man and his attempts to establish meaning to no more than a futile passion, to use Sartre's phrase. On the other hand, he that believeth shall not make haste, because the totality of meaning surrounds him, his labour is never in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 And the future does not depend upon his labour, while requiring it as a service, but on the Lord. In every age the existentialist has concluded, Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Such an attitude is a despair of time, a flight from responsibility and reality, and a destruction of hope. It stands in strong contrast to the Sabbath rest with others, in the sense of community, in rejoicing before the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 27 to 28, and elsewhere, the call is to eat, drink, and be merry, for the Lord is God, and his Sabbath rest is the gift of assured victory to man.